corn. Corn is an amazing plant. Corn was developed and cultivated 9,000 years ago in the south central highlands of what is now called Mexico by the indigenous people. It was a miracle. Developed from a wild grass that was called teosinte. 4,000 years ago, corn, as we know it now, made its way into Central and South America and up into the Southwest. 2,000 years ago, it was in the Northeast. Interestingly enough, only 500 years ago, when the Spanish invaded the quote-unquote New World, they took this miraculous genetic grain into Europe. And from there today, corn is grown on every single continent of the world except Antarctica. Every single month it is harvested somewhere in the world. Corn is a symbol of life for many, many people throughout the world. So it is not surprising that for us of, that have come from the Southwest, from the indigenous people here, that the corn mother, corn maiden, corn woman, is one of our most important deities because she represents not only femininity, the mother earth, she also represents to us the very essence of life. There are hundreds of varieties of corn in a myriad of beautiful colors from yellow and orange and purple and black to a bursting orange. Corn Mother is so important to us that there are numerous festivals and traditions and songs that celebrate her, not just here, but worldwide. I grew up surrounded by Corn Mothers, and so did you. I was born in 1958 in the Five Points, Curtis Park area of Denver. I lived in a huge Victorian house, surrounded all around me, by corn mothers and their stories. But before I can explain to you the significance of where I grew up and how it will relate to you, I want to take you on a brief journey back to 1870. In 1870, it was called the first golden age of Denver. The railroad had come to town. A lot of rich folk from back east were coming here to make their fame and fortune, and they built these beautiful houses over in Five Points. But something happened. In 1893, the silver crash occurred, which meant that all of the poor miners were coming to Denver in droves. So the people that lived in Five Points area, where I grew up, they didn't want to live with all of the poor people that were coming in and setting up shops. So they either went back east where they came from, or they moved to the more prestigious neighbors, neighborhood of Capitol Hill which did something very extraordinary. It opened up this area to people that were not desirable to live elsewhere, and they came. So that by 1920, our neighborhood was primarily African American and Latinos. By 1950, another wave came in of Japanese and Filipinos, and the whole area was something called redlined, which I didn't know what it meant at the time because I was very small, but it meant that basically we lived in a place that nobody else wanted to live in, in great big houses, and it also meant that we were a diverse neighborhood with different sounds and different cultures and different music and different foods, and everyone lived there and supported each other. It was much like this ear of corn. And as we lived there, I want to tell you that everybody grew some kind of garden. My house, where I lived at 21st and Tremont, my grandpa was a Filipino immigrant via Cannery Row, and my grandmother, Esther Amanita, a descendant of people from southern Colorado and northern New Mexico who were Pueblo Indian, Spanish, Portuguese, and French. <clears throat> Much like our neighborhood, we were woven together in a beautiful tapestry. The thing that connected us all is everybody liked to eat. Everybody liked to cook and share their recipes. Next door was Martha, who was a Roma gypsy from Hungary. Down the street was the Martinez kids that lived in the terraces, 
who actually thought that they made better green chili than my grandma? <laughs> I'm not quite sure to this day. But in the house that I lived in, upstairs lived the rumors. And not rumors where you're doing chisme about people, but rumors that rented the rooms. Victor Perez, who worked at the Denver Tea Room with my grandpa. Mr. Pruitt, who came from a country where they cooked this food that was made of cabbage and smelled funny because it was always in the bathtub because that was the only sink. Downstairs in the basement lived my dad. And on half of the house was my grandma and my grandpa, and the other house was my Auntie Mary, who I actually called my Tio Mary because she was the Mexican version of James Dean, complete with a motorcycle, rolled up cigarettes in her shirt, and beautiful women on the back of her motorcycle. <laughs> On Saturdays, my grandma and my tias, who lived on the west side, would pack Blanchweiger sandwiches, and we would hand them to the hobos that came from the trains. I did not know exactly what a hobo was, but I did know that they didn't have houses or places to eat, and my corn mothers told me that I was going to go out and take care of them like I was supposed to. In the backyard where we gardened, the three sisters, corn, beet, squash grew, and the, everybody gave everybody squash. You had so much squash. And we did not have zucchini bread back then, so believe me, <laughs> you ate a lot of calabacitas. But as we gardened, planted, sowed our seeds, the corn mothers, and I call them that because they are my women, they told me stories. They told us our mytho stories, stories of La Llorona, the weeping woman, or the blood-sucking goat, the chupalabras. Or they told us about the corn mothers, who basically, as I had told you, represented life and planting the seeds of hope. The corn mothers stand for rise. Let me tell you why. Resilience, replenish, invincible, sustainable, and empathy. They told us stories, stories about the Ludlow Massacre, they told us stories about black lung disease from the teals working in the mines. They told us stories about domestic violence, how Auntie Josephina had been shot in the head by her jilted lover. They told us stories of what we now call depression, but back then we didn't know what it was, postpartum depression when Cousin Raina went to the barn while her children slept and put a bullet in her head also. They told us stories of war. They told us stories of the Bataan Death March. We were told stories of loss of land, loss of language, and we were told stories about hate crimes against my Tio. My Tio, who was a tortilla maker. My Tio, Jakey, who wore dresses and looked like Carmen Miranda. And when he went out at night, sometimes he didn't come home because he got thrown into jail for indecency, or he got beat up on the way home. They told us stories about how you survive, no matter what comes into your life, that you can be resilient. They told us stories about epidemics, about the flu taking Uncle Ralph's two children. They told us stories about anything that you could think of that would break your heart, but it did not break your heart because that is what corn mothers do. Their stories aren't meant to terrify you, to make you angry or bitter. They're to teach you empathy for other people that may not look like you, may not practice the same religion, may not even love the same kind of people you love. But the corn mother stands strong and say, everyone is my child, everyone, we will work together in order to survive. Women's stories like Lucy Lucero, my auntie, who lost her last son and all of his friends to AIDS during the late 80s, and yet she continued to care for his partners that remained. I remember grabbing my auntie's hand one time and telling her, I think that you and my grandmas and my aunties are all corn mothers. And in fact, they were. They were all corn mothers. They talked to us also about how in the mining villages, the coal mines, everyone even if you couldn't speak the same language, played music together because they were all in the same boat trying to survive. They took care of each other's children. They shared stories. So this is where 
the Corn Mother Project comes in. In 2010, I gathered together a group of my compadres, Todd Pearson, photographer, Arlette Lucero, illustrator, Ed Winograd, Spanish English editor, Carl Ruby, storyteller, and later Tonette Brown, a graphic designer. I gathered them together with the Metropolitan State University of Denver Chicano Chicano Studies students from the Journey Through Our Heritage program, and we began a journey to find the stories of corn mothers throughout the Southwest. From the Aravaipa Canyons of Southeast Arizona to the wild Llanos of New Mexico to the fertile San Luis Valley, up through the mining towns of Trinidad Aguilar into Pueblo, where the steel mill was, and coming through Denver, the Mile High City, to the foothills of Boulder, into the one sweat plains of northern Colorado and southern Wyoming. And we asked people, tell us about your corn mothers. Tell us about your women. And they did. Over 70 portraits and stories of these beautiful women have been told to us and documented stories of people like Lois Burrell, African-American storyteller here in Colorado, who is well known for her hello people. And everybody reverts back to her. She grew up in 1940s in the Deep South and tells a fascinating story about how the black folk could not have septic systems in their houses, so you had to walk through poop every time you went out. But her mother, used to segregation, used to prejudice, used to bigotry, used her smarts, her convincing smile, and figured out a way that there was septic systems finally put into the black folks' neighborhood. Stories about Barbara Shannon Bannister, who was one of the first diversity officers in Aurora, Colorado, and founded the first African-American nonprofit arts organization here in Colorado. Stories about people like Concha Allen, who grew up in Chihuahua, but when her parents were coming here to the States, would have to leave her and her siblings for days and days in abandoned adobe buildings while they went to look for food and work. Stories about Rita Wallace de Flores, a Mexican folklorist who came to Colorado telling the story of her indigenous grandmothers and her Spanish grandmothers, but at the same time talking about how all of her teals and her grandpa had been executed. We have so many corn stories, mother stories, that can make a difference in our lives. Their women's stories are not here to make us feel sad, to make us feel angry, but to make us feel empowered, to make us feel like we can do something we can survive anything that comes our way. And if COVID-19 has not convinced every single person that we are all connected on this earth, there is nothing that happens any place on this planet that does not affect somewhere, somebody somewhere else. Because we are a living, breathing family that belongs connected to each other. And it is our women's stories that help us do that. You are surrounded by corn mothers. They are your mothers, your aunties. They are your sisters, your cousins. They are your coworkers. They are your colleagues. They are your teachers. They are your nurses. They are your electricians. They are your housekeepers. They are your doctors. They are your lawyers. They are everywhere around you. They are the waitresses that serve you coffee. They are there waiting for you to ask them, tell me your story. Because if you tell their story, what you're doing is more than just putting it into your heart. You're taking this ear of corn and taking a kernel from it and planting it. And then somebody else, when they are suffering, somebody else when they are facing a pandemic, somebody else when their child is in depression or or is having depression because they have just given birth, somebody else somewhere 
that is going through the same thing will take that kernel, that piece of that story that has been planted by you about the people and the women that you know that are your corn mothers, and they will be able to look at that story, that corn mother spirit, and they will be able to rise. They will be able to rise because they will be able to be resilient. They will be able to be invincible, sustainable, and to have empathy. There is a shy and traditional saying that says, no nation is conquered until the hearts of the women lay on the ground. And then no matter how powerful your weapons, no matter how strong your warriors, you are done. So let us look across the world at women, at their stories, and let us know that we are a nation, one nation, a world nation. And by uplifting our women and keeping their stories alive and their struggles and how they overcome them, we actually plant seeds of hope. We plant seeds of hope for a better future. We plant seeds of hope for equality and understanding and empathy. And I'd like to end with a quote that I'm paraphrasing from one of perhaps the finest writers of our time, Isabella Allende. Women do not need to be more like men. Women connected, educated, and in power are the one true hope that we have for this God-forsaken planet. You hold the key because your corn mother stories, the story of your women, are the true hope of our future. Omoteot. <laughs>